Hi everybody, David Rishpan with you once again for another tutorial here on YouTube. Today we are going to look at how to create your own parts, how to define a sonic landscape for an original artist, an original record. We've talked about how to learn parts, how to learn other people's parts, how to cover other people's parts on this channel. But today we're going to talk about how to create your own parts for a record or for a project. If you enjoy the content on this channel, please click like and subscribe to the channel. It's the easiest way to get us to grow. Follow me on other social media platforms, including Instagram and Facebook. Everything is at Rishpan Music. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please go over to Patreon, where you can support the channel financially, get access to exclusive content and PDFs. I'm starting a new project on my Patreon with Trio Brucho, where you get to see the creative process from start to finish. So please go over there and check it out. Now onto the video. So oddly enough, even though I've done a lot of different artistic projects, I haven't really been in a position where I get to define the sound of a record. Either it's the artist that already has ideas and has pre-produced demos and they want me to just copy what's on the demos, or it's a hip hop kind of produced situation where there's a producer that's already made a beat and I am tasked with recreating those sounds live, or it's a cover band situation where we're learning other people's music and other people's parts. So this record with the vocalist Sonia Johnson, her last album, Chrysalis, was one of the first times in terms of synth playing that I've been able to define a sound from the ground up. So Sonia had recorded these songs previously in more of an acoustic jazz format, and she made it clear to all of us in the band when we started rehearsing for this album that she wanted to go in a more electric direction, in more of a quote-unquote pop direction. Those are her words. Um, and as we rehearsed, certain touchstones became really important to me for this record, one of them being George Duke and a lot of those classic 70s records, including Brazilian Love Affair from 1979, Another touchstone was Robert Glasper and the Robert Glasper experiment, especially the Black Radio and Art Science records with both Robert and Casey Benjamin on synthesizers and the way they would layer synthesizers behind acoustic piano was a really important uh, influence for me on this record. And finally, Joe Zawinul from Weather Report was among one of the first uh, improvising keyboardists I heard on synthesizers, and he still remains uh, a huge landmark for me in terms of how I conceive of synth orchestration. So let's dive into my main stage file and look at each individual patch, each individual sound for a couple of these tunes. We're going to take a closer look at the patches I used on Sonia Johnson's record Chrysalis, and these are the same patches I used live. Um, the first tune we're going to start with is Monsters, which is the most synth-heavy patch of them all, I think. And this was developed in conjunction with Sonia through the rehearsals. It was based on her demo that she made with bassist Mark Haynes, and there were these kind of floaty, spacey pads in the demo. But I also wanted something that would kind of hover over the horn section because there's a pretty uh, intricate and colorful horn arrangement on the record. And I knew going in to record the album that Sonia was planning on writing for horns. So I kind of programmed all of this to sit above her horn section or kind of in the sides, if you think of uh, the center of your stereo image and then the sides. I wanted it to be rather side heavy and just kind of create these colors and textures around the horns. The first thing you'll see is that in main stage, I have it locked to a tempo. This is the tempo that we recorded the album at at, at 90 BPM. Um, when we play live, we're not that far from... 90 BPM, even though we don't play to a click. 
as I've mentioned in previous main stage videos, I name the patch in my patch list here on the left. I name the patch after the song so that when we play live, I know that this is the sound for monsters. And then each individual channel strip, you'll see these four layers here, each channel strip is named after the sound that I'm using. I use presets, or at least I start from presets, and then I tweak from there. And then whatever happens, if I update Arturia, or if I update any piece of software, if I update my OS, or update MainStage, and if for some reason I would happen to lose uh, the actual installed plugin, I could go back and know that it was based on whatever preset that's written in the channel strip and then work my way backwards from there instead of having to recreate anything from scratch. So the first layer is the Arturia CS80 and it's a preset called Living Water, although you can see with the asterisk that I have modified it. I probably landed on this sound originally because of the name. Again, I was thinking of patches with movement and patches that would kind of not be distracting or move too much, but just have some interesting back and forth that would distinguish it from both the roads and from the horns. So this patch on its own sounds like this. The next part of the sound is from Native Instruments Massive, and it's a patch called Dreamers. Again, I probably selected it because of the name. It's with the CS80 is that it has this kind of upper octave, this upper harmonic that just pops out over the CS80 sound without uh, dominating too much. And it's also with that upper octave, it's kind of merging with the flutes, uh, with, with the flute and the clarinets and kind of staying out of the way of the guitar and keyboard comping and also out of the way of the majority of the horn arrangement. So that sound on its own sounds like this. And then layered with the CS80 sounds like this. The third part of this patch is Applied Acoustic Systems from here in Montreal and their Lounge Lizard electric piano instrument. And there's a preset in the custom bank called Remixer Keys that I really, really like. It kind of doesn't sound like any particular electric piano and it doesn't really sound dated to any one kind of era. Uh, I really like the swimmy kind of chorus sound that it has. Um, and you'll see that I have quite a lot of delay and reverb. Now, what I'm using this for is for a little bit more of a transient or attack on the note. You'll see that on the CS80 and the massive patches, they're pretty slow attack pads. So I wanted to have something underneath that just gave it a little bit more of a transient, a little bit more definition. And I'm using the delay and reverb again, to kind of put information into the sides and create this kind of mist or fog around the notes that's different than using a long release time on a pad. I find a long release time uh, can get really, really muddy, especially if you have uh, chromatically moving chords. And the other thing about effects is that I can EQ which frequencies are going to the effects. So you'll see the delay here has a cutoff and I'm cutting off at two, 2K about. And the reverb, I'm filtering out anything below 60. And uh, unfortunately this high, this high cut doesn't give it in frequencies, 
but I'm also shelf shelving off some of the highs. So compared to a long release time on a synth where it's the entire sound that's sustaining with a delay and a reverb, I can EQ out what is kind of hovering over the rest of the sound. And I prefer to do that on chord progressions that kind of move uh, through some chromatic changes. I prefer to do that in general so that it's the reverb and the effects that kind of hang over and dissipate, and I can focus which frequency range they live in versus an entire sound that's just sustaining and, and decaying. So the remixer keys are also going through another chain of effects in guitar rig in addition to the delay and reverb that's already there. The delay and reverb and chorus are now running through additional delay from the tape echo emulation, and then all of those effects are running through the cabinet emulation of Control Room Pro. I have a 2x12 blackface style cab with the mix of a 421, and a 57 and I think I had to move one out of out of phase a little bit just so it would align so the remixer keys patch with guitar rig on sounds like this All three of these layers so far sound like this. The last part of the live patch is the Scarby Classic EP88 which has become my go-to road sound. And this is filling the place of the actual Fender Rhodes that I played on the record. So when we did the bed tracks, the full band rhythm section, I played Fender Rhodes and then I overdubbed these keyboards, these synths later. So this uh, Scarby is just emulating what I played in the bed track of the record. So on the album, I played the studio's Fender Rhodes through a Fender Princeton amplifier. And you'll see I have the same delay setting, the same amp setting, but now this one is also going through a tremolo, which emulates the Princeton tremolo that I recorded with. So now all four of those parts together sounds like this. One note about how we did this for the album, what I wound up doing was I wound up copying all three of these sounds, so everything minus the roads. I copied all of these sounds into Logic, and I tracked MIDI for one part because it's all a layer. It's all supposed to read as a layer, as a hybrid sound. They're not separate parts. And so for the engineer, for Poirik Butnerschneer, our engineer, producer, mixer, to have more control about how each individual layer would sit, I tracked one part with the... I overdubbed one part, saved the MIDI in Logic, and then ran the MIDI through the two other sounds and sent them to Poirik as separate individual files per each sound, which allowed him to rebalance each individual sound as needed in the final mix. If you're new to main stage, you will see these uh, arrows with a circle. And this means that these are the root patch for an alias, which means that I'm using these sounds somewhere else in the concert. And instead of just duplicating them and having to use more memory and more CPU, 
when you duplicate it as an alias, that alias is pointing to the exact same source uh, instance of the patch. So I wound up using this also in a tune called Prelude to Danger. And again, you will see that I have Living Water and Massive Dreamers. Now, when you alias a patch, everything is copied from the original instance except your fader volume. What's good is that it can be the exact same sound inside of the plugin, but if you want to rebalance things, then when you change the fader positions or the pan positions, uh, those are individual per patch. So you can get away with kind of using the same sounds over and over again, but then rebalancing them in a subtle way on your faders. And then that gives it a bit of a different character. This sound came about because as we recorded the song, it felt very much like a Robert Glasper vibe to me. And so that's where I was going with this, with this patch. I wanted to kind of round out the sound of this pad because I didn't want it to move quite as much. I wanted those movement elements to be under a more static kind of classic analog sounding pad. For that, I used the Prophet. Uh, this is the Arturia Prophet 5 emulation, and I'm using a modified preset called Classic Pad, which, again, the channel strip is named that way. If I lost everything in my Prophet 5, I would know to go to the Classic Pad preset in Arturia. So all three of those layers now sound like this. And then the final element of this patch, Prelude to Danger, is this Arturia ARP 2600. Joe Zawinul and Weather Report are one of my touchstones for synthesis and electric keyboards and musicality in general. And there was a fade out on this tune. And I just asked Sonia, like, what do you think if I play this on synth? And I wound up coming up with this synth hook that's now the instrumental hook of the song, sort of blowing minimal synth lines on the outro. Uh, and this is a sound that I love in the in the ARP 2600. Again, I kind of have that, that classic Zawinul lead, which is from Black Market and kind of like the Lyricon kind of sound. Just those little interjections that he would do at the end of Weather Report records. But again, you see the asterisk, you see that I've modified it a little bit. When you're in a rehearsal and you need to get a sound fast, it's fine to start from presets just to get you in the ballpark and then you can tweak it from there. At least that's how I approach these things. You'll see that the profit with this green arrow means it's also aliased, and it's aliased from this chrysalis patch. Now, chrysalis is kind of an interlude. It's like the last track on the record, and it's basically a drum feature. And when Sonia sent me the demo, she had stacked a bunch of her own vocals. And I had the idea of doubling the vocal arrangement with these big, big, big synths. So what's going on in this sound? So we have the same Prophet pad that we just, the Prophet Classic pad that we just looked at. And this is the source. This is where it's coming from. The circle with the arrow means it's the source instance. And then I have two layers of Montreal's Applied Acoustic Systems. Okay, so this I've upgraded to uh, to Ultra Analog 3, but this is from the VA2 Legacy, and it's just called a PWM pad. I should probably rename the channel strip. On the other layer, we have the Profit pad, which I could probably... This is an issue with Ultra Analog is actually some of the stuff that was in VA2 that I love 
I haven't been able to find or replicate in VA3. And then the last element is Native Instruments Massive once again. This is a Fairlight Vox patch because I wanted something that had a vocal quality to try to match Sonia's vocal overdubs. Thanks for watching. I hope that was insightful. If you wondered what I used on Sonia's record or how I organized my main stage file or anything about synth programming, uh, please let me know in the comments if you have any more questions about how I approach this kind of stuff, any comments about videos you would like to see on this channel. Once again, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Follow me on other social media, especially Instagram and Facebook. And if you're feeling really generous, please go over to Patreon, support the channel financially, get some extra bonus content. And there is a new project underway with my band Trio Brucho, where you get to see my creative process from start to finish. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you next week. Peace.